As you may have picked up by now, today is Ascension Sunday. It's the time, the Sunday, when we remember how Jesus ascended into heaven. It's part of a whole sequence of events in his life. We all know he was born at Christmas, right? Then he called the disciples when he was about 30 years old, spent the next three years traveling around with them, teaching and healing. In the process, he made the religious leaders and the civic leaders mad. Then we know he was killed right on Good Friday, came back to life on Easter Sunday, and then he appeared to the disciples and all kinds of other people for the next 40 days. And then he ascended back into heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but as a kid, I, I, I don't remember ever hearing about Ascension Sunday. I was wondering about this this week, and I was looking at this passage from Luke and, and wondering how, why this isn't more prevalent in my mind from day one. And I decided that I had a good excuse because I noticed that in the 10 verses we read this morning, only a half of a verse talks about the ascension. So I have decided that clearly most of my life I was so focused on the other nine and a half verses that I kind of missed that one little part. Now I'm sure that all of you know this story forward and backward, right? Here in this passage, Jesus told the disciples, everything written about me in the scriptures must be fulfilled. I must suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. You all need to go out and tell everybody to repent that their sins will be forgiven. But don't worry, God has promised you to give you the power to do these things. So stay in Jerusalem until you get this power. And then he led them outside the city, lifted up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he went up into heaven. Huh. Now, at our second service here at St. John's, we talk about this almost every Sunday because we recite the Apostles' Creed. And that says, he was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated, seated at the right hand of God the Father. So, of course, the second service people, they've got this one down cold. But you and I maybe were not quite so up on all this ascension stuff. But you know what? There are other places you can hear about it or even see about it. Some artists over time have been sort of taken by this whole ascension thing and have created beautiful paintings about it. I've seen a few that were not quite so beautiful. Basically, they were like clouds with somebody's feet sticking out from the bottom. <laughs> it doesn't do much for me. So I had to look a little harder to find a few pictures. But I found three pictures I want to show to you. Let's see if we can put one of them on the screen. All right. Any art history majors here? Nobody's going to admit it. All right. I have notes, so we'll be all right. This is a painting by Giovanni Battista, sometimes called Giovanni Domenico Tiepolo. Pardon, my Italian is not very good. So what do we see in this picture? Who do you think? Who's this? Very nice. And how about all these people here? Who are these people? Disciples, yeah. Here's one guy who's got his arms sort of stretched out. Can't quite tell what this one's doing. He's looking up. He's got his arms out. They're all kind of going like this, right? Kind of like, like what Jesus is doing. All right, how about another picture? Here's one. See, next time you go to a museum, you're going to be so prepared, you'll be able to explain this to everybody. All right, we've got Jesus here again, going up with his arms outstretched. This one's a little different. I see some other things here. What do you see? A little Cupid. I think they have, I can't tell if those are wings or just cloth. I think that's just cloth. 
there are a bunch of them hiding in here. This is for all the babies who came to church this morning. And again, we got the arms sort of stretched out, right? It's a little hard to see what they're all doing. All right, we got one more picture. That last one was by Benjamin West, by the way. This one is by Rembrandt. So another common theme, we got Jesus in the middle with his arms upraised, right? Can you make out what's down here? Yeah, more babies. Cherubs, these actually appear to have wings. And I see one person over here, and there's some more hiding, but they're a little hard to see. That's a dove up there. It's a little foreshadowing for next Sunday. So I was looking at all these pictures. I was especially interested in the people down at the bottom. Maybe we can go back to that first one. Can we go back to that first one? Yeah, there we go. Because here you can see all the disciples. Which one do you think would be you as you look at that picture? Hard to say, huh? I looked at this picture and I thought, you know, I don't think I'm in this picture because I'd be the one hanging on to his ankles. <laughs> Saying, no, don't go, don't leave me, I need you, I'm not ready to do this by myself. Maybe some of these people were doing that and they just, they, they, their hands slipped. Maybe we can go with that. I'm pretty sure I'd be hanging on dear, for dear life, begging him not to go. And then I would drop down and I'd look around and feel really silly because nobody else is doing the same thing. I'd be up there by myself. So maybe that's not how it would have happened. I don't know. Knowing me, I probably would have done that. But I don't see anybody sobbing like I would. They look kind of startled, maybe. I don't know. I was thinking about all the different farewell scenes that I've experienced. My family does a lot of crying at airport security checkpoints. <laughs> Unfortunately, the people there are usually very kind. I was thinking back to another time. I thought, well, Sue, try to think of something, at some time when you left a loved one or a loved one left you and you didn't just sob your way through it. And I got to thinking about back in college, I used to spend spring break with my grandparents in Illinois because they were my closest relative to New England. Um, and so I'd go see them and have a good week with them. And I remember, I think my senior year of college, it was time to go back to school and my grandfather drove me to the bus. And he said to me before I got on the bus, he said, Sue, by the time you get to your dorm room, it's gonna be dark. And so I want you to have this flashlight. He gave me this old fashioned flashlight, still in a little cardboard box. It was very old fashioned. But I knew he'd gone to the hardware store sometime during that week and gotten that flashlight for me, knowing I might need it at the other end of my journey. <clears throat> so he gave it to me. I was kind of surprised because like my dad, the men in my family are not known for buying extravagant gifts. <laughs> but I was so touched that he had thought about me earlier enough to plan to get this flashlight and made the effort, and he'd even put the batteries in it. You know? He was a quiet, practical man, and that was his way of showing his love for me, giving me that flashlight so I'd be prepared. So I got on that bus, and I sat down, and I waved at him from the window. I can see him so clearly in my memory, standing there, tall, standing up straight as he always did, looking dapper in a beige raincoat and, you know, one of those hats that men used to wear in the 50s? Looking pretty dapper. And as the bus pulled away, I wondered if I'd ever see him again. And I didn't. Not on this earth, anyway. But Grandpa gave me the power to continue on in the journey. Well, I don't see Jesus handing out flashlights in these pictures. But as he was departing, he said to the disciples, stay here 
I'm going to send you what you need. And those are the last words they heard from him before he went up out of their sight. And the Gospel of Luke tells us that they didn't sob and cry and beg him not to go. They didn't wave flashlights. We're told that they were joyous. They worshipped him and then returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed there continually worshipping God in the temple as they waited for this power, this promised inheritance to arrive. They waited to receive this power, worshiping God in the temple. And that's what you and I are doing this morning, worshiping God together in God's house, knowing that we've been promised a wonderful inheritance, although we can't see Jesus anymore. Jesus is going to give us something to help us continue in our journeys. And that's why we're here. Here we are. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices who wondrous things has done in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. On this Mother's Day, as we remember our moms or those who have acted as our moms and showed us the way and gotten us up and going. We remember how God has provided this care for us in one form or another to empower us. God has not abandoned us. God has empowered us. Amen.